So what we're here to talk about today is exactly what you see on the screen, VDI for the real world. Now, for those of you that are familiar with scale, what scale has built is essentially a virtualization infrastructure that lets you not have to think about your infrastructure. Self heals, self load balances, it's priced right. It's built so that you can spend your time thinking about things that actually move the business forward rather than, oh, trying to chase down which drive's acting funny or what cable got kicked out in the middle of the night. So what we wanted to do here was bring to your attention the fact that through a, a, a joint partnership between Scale and LeoStream, we are bringing that same concept of easy to use, easy to consume, easy to manage VDI to the world. I'd also like to introduce Karen Gondoli, CEO of, of LeoStream. Thanks, Alan. Hey, thanks for having us. We're very excited to participate in this webinar and looking forward to telling you a little bit more about who LeoStream is and what we bring to the table. Outstanding. So without further ado, Scott, let's get started. Little quick background on who Scale is. Essentially, better part of uh, actually over a decade ago now, we sat down here at Scale and tried to answer a simple question. Why was highly available virtualization so complex, so expensive? Why did it have so many moving parts from so many different vendors? And how could it be made better? Well, upon discovering that realistically virtualization historically was never holistically designed, we decided to fix that. Start with a clean sheet of paper and build out a virtual infrastructure, an entire virtual architecture from the ground up with the real world in mind, one in which you didn't need to be a VCP and a CCNE and a SNEA certified storage engineer just to be able to make it go. Now, this radical simplification of how virtualization should be done in the first place has resulted in our HC3 platform, running on things as small as the Intel NUC all the way out at the edge, to the fog, to the core, to the cloud and back, done across the board in such a way that it's consumable by anybody and done at a price point that nobody else really gets anywhere near. Highly simplified, highly available, lose any component anywhere at any time. But realistically, it's built because you have better things to do with your time than chase down virtualization issues and server issues. It's autonomous HCI. This from the folks that coined the term hyperconverged in the first place. So let's move forward a little bit. Over the last decade and change, you've seen it roll out globally. Organizations, they just don't want complexity. They don't need it. We've all got way too much to do to waste our time the way we had to through the last decade, chasing down componentry, getting a vendor A and vendor B and vendor C to all play nice together. We've also discovered over the last decade that while the cloud has its place, quite frankly, an awful lot of data is generated outside the, the confines of the traditional legacy data center and cloud. Now this has been summed up in a term you guys will have heard as edge computing. Now, IoT, that's part of it. Smart sensors, smart everything. It needs something local to talk to for immediacy of decision making, for determining what's important and what isn't. It's very much a hybrid world. Well, that's what HC3 addresses. Whether you're an SMB or a mid-market shop or a distributed enterprise, a grocery store chain, a um, oil derrick out in the Gulf, HC3 has a line specifically for you. Let's face it, the way we all used to do things, that inverted pyramid of doom of servers plus switches plus SAN plus hypervisor plus somebody else's DR, 
That just doesn't cut it in today's world. Next, Scott. So, BDI. For the past decade and a half, anybody that followed the analysts out there in the world, they always had the same prediction every January. This will be the year of VDI. You know what it never was? The year of VDI. Reasons why are simple. Much like virtualization itself, it was complex. It was awfully expensive, far more so than your average SMB or mid-market consumer could ever contemplate. The benefits were wildly outweighed by the complexity, the cast of associated servers. It was hard to set up, a lot of moving parts, and it required specialists. Matter of fact, the only folks historically that could really take advantage of VDI were very large enterprises that could benefit from a scale of 10,000 plus seed implementations. Well, there's been a huge demand for VDI for years, but one that wasn't complex, one that could go from out of the box to carving desktops in a matter of less than an hour. That's what Scale and LeoStream have set out to create. Next. Now, with scale, simplicity is the order of the day. Unified management, no LUNs to deal with. The storage self-heal, self-load balances. The virtualization platform itself does the same thing. Self-healing, self-load balancing, DR, all of the, the table stakes features that virtualization has come to mean, simply built in. Start with a single node, grow to match your needs. All done at a price point, and this one was a biggie for us here at scale. Virtualization shouldn't come at a 1600% price premium over the cost of the gear it runs on. That's just ridiculous. We focused very specifically on the needs of the real world. The school districts, the distributed enterprises, the small businesses where people don't happen to have a fleet of VCPs on staff. They've got three, four, five, six guys whose business card reads IT guy. Scale makes that guy a hero by giving him an infrastructure that'll go toe to toe with the legacy, do things it can't do, and do it at a price that doesn't break the budget. Next. Now, rather than speaking to LeoStream, I'm gonna let Karen do that. Okay, thanks, Alan. So to tell you a little bit about LeoStream, we've actually been around since 2002, and that may surprise some of you because we might be the VDI company that you've never heard of. But we've essentially been around for as long as virtualization has been. And we were founded back when virtualization meant virtualizing servers. And what we started with was a, a physical to virtual converter, what we called our P2V tool. And the whole idea there was to help organizations move their physical workloads over to these new virtual environments that were gaining traction. Now, what our founders noticed at that time was not only did people need help moving physical workloads to virtual machines, they also needed a management tool for them. You know, this is back in the day before VMware had vCenter or any other platform had a, a management tool for their virtual machines. So we built what we called the virtual machine manager. Now, over time, what's happened is that virtual machine manager has evolved over years and years of customer feedback. And it's also evolved with the market so that as new virtualization platforms came into being or new display protocols came into being, we made sure that we wrapped everything into our platform, turning that virtual machine manager really into the virtual desktop connection management platform 
that we have today. Now, what, what often happens as you evolve software over time, you get features that come in and, and the system can start getting a little bit complex. So what we did with LeoStream 9 just this past year is we really, what I say, crossed the chasm. We took this very feature rich platform and we simplified it. We put on a new UI, we cleaned up the interface to remove features using our license key so that if you didn't need a feature, you didn't have to see it in your interface. And this really has made LeoStream 9 be applicable to anyone. And this is why we now say we do have VDI for the rest of us because we can give you the flexibility that you need, but in a really simple, easy to use, almost wizard-like interface. Now we are LeoStream as a company, we, we're deployed around the globe. You see just a small example of the different types of cus customers and companies that use our platform to manage their virtual desktop infrastructure and the remote access to those platforms. Now, the, the thing about the previous slide, you saw the tenants that scale holds to high availability, high scalability. This is why our teams and our products work so well together is that those are the same tenants that we've designed the LeoStream platform around from the get-go. What's next? Oh, so in, in addition to the platform and the functionality that it provides, one of the nice things about working with LeoStream is you're not just working with the product, you're, you're really working with our team. If there's something I'm very proud about with how we've structured this company is that we are very focused on our customer's success. And that goes from ensuring that the features and functionality you need are in the product to working with you through your deployments and through any type of service calls that you have. It's, it's quotes like this one you see here from Paris Community Health, which is a joint customer of Scale Computing and LeoStreams. And these are the types of quotes that I hear often and which just make my day because it really stands to the type of company that we are and while we're excited to work with everybody. All right, Alan, you want to go into this part? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So to really understand what VDI is, it's best to think of it as a, a three-legged stool, okay? Leg one, let's go ahead and jump there. It's the virtual infrastructure. The virtual infrastructure that underlies your virtual desktop initiative, your virtual desktop infrastructure. Now, historically, that could have been VMware, that could have been Hyper-V, that could have been Zen, that could have been Rev, that could have been any of many but they all shared a common problem. Complex, expensive, not holistically designed pieces, parts from different vendors that you as a sysadmin got the joy, air quotes, of trying to keep held together, required specialists from multiple disciplines in the IT world to really make it work. Well, for those of you that know scale, you know that we have infrastructure handled in spades. Automated, really don't have to think of it. To, to paraphrase the army, it's very fire and forget. Bring it up, tell it to go, and it just does. You don't have to spend time thinking about it anymore. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. Now, leg number two, when it comes to VDI, that's the connection broker. Now, the connection broker, what it really is, is the piece that ties your end users to infrastructure, automates the life cycle management of those desktops, when to spin up new instances from golden master image, when to power them on, when to shut them down, when to delete them, how to connect users from AD or LDAP directly to individual instances as they're brought online. The connection broker also needs to know how to speak directly to leg number one, the infrastructure piece. Because at the end of the day, it's really all about automation. 
Okay. The benefit of VDI has always been a benefit for the sysadmin. I don't have to run around to one or two or three or four or five or 600 desktops supplying patches and fixing user issues. I manage a golden image. Well, historically, it had the same problem that infrastructure had. There were folks that did it, whether it's Vue or Citrix or pick your poison, but there was always a pile of licensing and a cast of supporting servers to be able to make that happen. Well, that's the beauty of LeoStream. They've been able to eliminate all the cruft and bring the same simplicity to the connection broker, the lifecycle manager, that scale brought to infrastructure. Let me, I, I, I don't want to try and oversell this, but it's a very important point. Instead of having to have five or six or seven different dedicated servers to handle the overhead tasks associated with BDI, with LeoStream, you got one if you want to run a gateway and it installs with a single curl command could not be simpler if it tried so realizing these first two legs of the the stool that is VDI really required two partners to work very tightly together scale and LeoStream decided to tackle this why it's never been the year of VDI problem by bringing cost effectiveness and simplicity to a place it had never really been before. LeoStream took the time to natively code support for all of HC3's APIs directly into their core product directly into the connection broker itself so that it can reach directly into HC3 clusters, understand what golden images are, leverage our native thin cloning, spin up VMs, spin them back down, delete them, recreate new ones after a patch Tuesday, all without the end user not really having to think about it. That's the key here. Native, well thought out, well-implemented support. Now, the third leg of the connection of, of the VDI stool, believe it or not, is kind of optional depending on use case. You see, with some folks, you want to be able to maintain user profiles, okay? With other implementations, you absolutely don't. For example, in an office setting, VDI for, say, an accounting group, they want to be able to maintain. They need to be able to maintain their desktop settings, their wallpaper, their My Documents, etc. But in, say, a library kiosk scenario or a classroom, you very much don't want that. You want to be able to simply, as soon as the user logs out, delete the VM they've been using and spin up a new one. Well, for those cases that really need that profile management piece, there's a couple of cool options out there. Profile Unity from Liquidware does exactly that, captures the profiles, containerizes them and homes them, automatically connecting them to VDI instances as users log in with their domain credentials and disconnecting them as soon as they log back out. Microsoft also offers the exact same concept through a product they acquired just over a year ago called FS Logics. Now, the interesting part about FS Logics, while it works in a very similar fashion, Microsoft has made it free to anybody with RDS cows. Those three pieces together are what comprise VDI. Those are the three legs of the stool. Next. Karen, back to you. Let's talk a little more about the LeoStream platform so people can understand that simplicity better. Sounds good to me. So I know a lot of you are very familiar with Scale, but you're probably new to LeoStream. So I wanted to take a little time to just talk to you about what it is that we provide, how it works a little bit together, and then we'll even do a demo showing it working with our Scale environment. 
So what you see here is essentially a high-level architecture diagram of the four components that comprise the LeoStream platform. At the heart of it is the connection broker. That's what you see in the center. It is the brains of the operation. It's where you define your pools and it handles your user logins. It's going to track us usage of resources for you. It is the one piece of the platform that is basically required. To the left of that, you see the LeoStream gateway. As Alan mentioned, it's actually optional. It's a separate machine and it performs gateway functionality, whether that be for remote access, so users outside of your data center network can access their VMs, or maybe you just want to leverage its HTML5 viewer. But again, it is optional in the setup. On the far right, you see the LeoStream agent. It's a small component, but a very important one. It is providing information to the connection broker about the user's session so that the broker always knows what's going on in your VDI environment. And then finally, the fourth component on the far left is LeoStream Connect. It's a software client, and as you'll see, it's not the only client users can use to log into LeoStream, but we do provide that in case you want to have a software version for a login portal. So now let's actually look at each of these components in a little more detail. Of course, we'll start with the broker. So it essentially, and you see its interface there on the right, it's the command center for everything. It is going to give you that single pane of glass where you can manage any of the resources that you're hosting, whether in your data center or in the cloud, and that you want users to have access to. You'll see in the demo that through plans and policies and pools, you have a lot of flexibility in the connection broker to define different types of VDI workflows. And we talk a lot about persistent machines and non-persistent machines, but there's a lot of variation in, in how you manage those. How long does the user have access to their machine? When do you perform the refresh and delete the machine? We'll show you how you can define that in the broker. Now, as Alan mentioned, one of the keys for these non-persistent workflows is the ability to spin up and tear down machines. And the broker provides pooling capability where you can set thresholds for the number of machines that should be available and even do that based on time of day. So for example, for labs, for a university that has labs, maybe you only want your machines running or created during the time that lab is going on. You can actually automate these types of rules using the connection broker to really optimize your back end. And then, of course, one of the things we see people really appreciate in the broker is if you have a single login portal where your users get access to everything, then IT has a single portal where they can track who's using what. And this is important because you can tell do I have pools that are underutilized? If so, I can leverage that compute for another group of users. Or maybe I have pools that are, are hitting their limits and I need to actually allocate more compute over there. So using the tracking capabilities in the broker, you really have a pulse on what's going on in your system and can not only automate it, but optimize it as well. So next we have the LeoStream agent. And I call it small but mighty because it is a tiny little it's a service for Windows. And we do also have a Linux version, and it's, it's actually a Java version. It runs on Linux and Mac. So that's one another strength of the LeoStream environment is you can actually manage all of these different operating systems from a same, single remote access portal. Now, the agent is running on the remote machine, and it's telling the broker, what is your user doing? When did they log in? Did they log out? Have they disconnected? Did their session go idle? And you'll see that what the connection broker administrator can do is automate events or automate tasks based on those events. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you want to disconnect the user if they've gone idle for a half hour. You can set up rules that do that so you don't have to watch for those events. They just automatically happen. Now, in the case of a non-persistent workflow, the LeoStream agent has one other function, which is very important. And that's it is able to join machines to domains and reset host names. So if you are provisioning off new machines, that's another step of the process that we can automate for you is the domain join and the host name. 
The last thing that the agent gives is basically those last mile end user experience features. It, along with our Leotrium Connect client, both contain a set of USB drivers. And what these allow you to do actually is use your Leostream environment to, to lock down USB redirection to your remote machine. And the nice thing is you can, you can even do that by location because what you'll see is that in Leostream, you'll define what the user has access to, not only based on who they are, but also where they come in from. So by using our USB device redirection, you can say, well, if the user is at their desk, there are certain devices that they need to pass through to the remote machine in order to get their job done. But now if they're logging in from a coffee shop, well, I want to lock down USB redirection so my data never leaves the data center. So it's that type of functionality that the Leostream agent brings to the table as well. So the third component is the Leostream gateway. Now, I, I should mention, Alan did mention that our broker installs on a virtual machine. It's CentOS RREL, and that's the same for the Leostream gateway. So the nice thing is you don't use up a Windows Server license installing our component. They'll both, in, both install on CentOS RREL, and they need to be separate. So the Leostream gateway is on its own machine somewhere, and it is, as we say, a gateway. And it's really a gateway in a few ways. So one thing... Your broker is typically hosted on your HC3 infrastructure along with your virtual machines. And that's important because the Leostream agents need to be able to communicate with the connection broker and vice versa. Now the gateway, you want it to be accessible for remote users, but it also needs to be accessible to the connection broker. Now your remote users, well, they can't see your connection broker, they're outside the network. So the gateway acts as a tunnel for broker logins as well. So the broker, the user hits the gateway and the gateway redirects the login to the connection broker. So now you don't have to expose your connection broker to the internet, only the gateway is exposed. So the gateway broker, or sorry, the gateway passes along the logins. And then obviously once the user connects to their desktop, it tunnels the desktop connection as well. Now the Leostream gateway can work in two modes when it comes to connecting the user to their desktop. One is what I call client-based access. So if you think in terms of an RDP connection, I launch mstsc.exe and then that's an RDP connection. That's a client. MSTSC is the display protocol's client. The gateway can launch a variety of different client-based display protocols, but it also includes a built-in HTML5 viewer for clientless access. So now if my users have Chromebooks, if they're coming in from a mobile device, I don't need to install a client, I just use their web browser. And then actually in the web browser, we can launch an RDP, a VNC, or even an SSH connection for those developers who love their Linux prompts. Now the, the fourth thing that a gateway does, even if you're not talking about remote users, the gateway acts as a gatekeeper to your Leostream environment if you install it. Because what you can do is you can lock away your connection broker and your desktops in a network that the users can't access, and then use the gateway as a way to restrict access into those resources. And that's kind of what we call rogue, re restricting rogue user access, where a rogue user is someone that Leostream hasn't authenticated. So it does give you not only remote access, but a little bit more control over securing your environment in isolated networks. All right. The last component is Leostream Connect. And as I mentioned, it's essentially, it's a software client that provides a login portal. And you, you see a screenshot of the Windows version there. There is also a Java version that runs on Linux and Mac. So if you're doing a BYOD, it doesn't really matter to us what operating system your users want to want to be, want to bring, we have a version that they can install. Now the Leostream Connect does, it launches these client-based protocols. So it can launch the RDP client, it can launch the PC over or the HPRGS client. And as I mentioned, it does have the USB device passer control integrated with it as well. But that's not the only client device that a user can use to log into Leostream. Any web browser number of different thin clients, zero clients, mobile clients, you have a lot of flexibility in what type of device the user can bring to the table 
that allows them to get access to their Leo stream environment. All right, next. So before we show a demo, this I just want to kind of sum up here the whole combination of scale computing HC3 and LeoStream. The whole idea, and hope we've got we've gotten this across, is it really has made VDI simple and intuitive, and really just opened it up for new markets and new applications well beyond what people typically think VDI can do, just because of the way this is all architected. And I think with that, it should be demo time. So Scott's going to pass over the ball to me. I'm going to show my screen. And hopefully now you are seeing my screen. And this should look familiar to those who have used scale computing before. This is my scale computing cluster. Now we have your, your typical kind of three node cluster here. And I've I've kind of prepped the environment to be used with LeoStream. First thing I did was obviously install my connection broker here. So this is a CentOS machine that I installed. And then as Alan mentioned, single curl command that installed the broker and then I was up and running. Now, the other thing I did to prime my scale environment was I needed to create that golden image that Alan mentioned about. And you'll see down here somewhere, I have a tag here for template inside of scale computing. Anything that's in this template tag by default is considered a golden image in your LeoStream environment. And one of the things that you'll see in the upcoming version of LeoStream is you have control to define a user defined template, but for now it, it needs to be template. And this here, this Win10 master, that's my golden image. So now let's take a look at the Leo stream. And that's really all I needed to do inside the cluster to prep for my, my environment. So now let's look at the broker itself. That's what you see here. So even if you're not familiar with Linux and the thought of installing the broker on CentOS and using a curl command to install it is a little bit dicey, that's all you need to do with the Linux system. After that, everything is configured through this interface that you see here. Uh, this is brandable. I added extra logos for our demo, and you can change the colors and logos. It's customizable for how you want in case you want your end users to use this as a login portal. I'm going to sign in as the main LeoStream administrator. And what you'll see here is this is set up as basically menus down the left. And this is that wizard that's going to kind of step you through this setup, starting with setup. So what I tell everyone is start here and just work your way down. In the setup section, you're going to connect your connection broker to all the external systems that you need to work with. It's, it's the rest of your VDI environment, starting with your authentication servers. By default, we support Active Directory, and we see a lot of people using Active Directory for authenticating users, for joining, obviously, computers to that domain. But we do support a number of other types of authentication systems. So if you find that you're rolling out different types of MFA providers, whether those are SAML based or have a radius, uh, except radius calls, we can actually integrate with these different MFA providers as well. So you'll hook us up to your authentication servers, and then you hook us up to your hosting platforms. So here is the part of where the integration is with the scale computing platform. So here you'll notice I have a center for my scale cluster. I've only entered in the IP address of one of my nodes, but I can actually enter in the IP address for all the nodes, and then the broker will handle the failover. So if there's an issue with one node, we'll go and talk to the other one. But that's all I need to do is give it the IP addresses of my nodes, and then the credentials for a user who has permission to execute the APIs that we leverage. Here's where I mentioned you can tell us what the template name is for your images. And then that's it. Hit save. And then automatically, as soon as you hit save, LeoStream reaches out to your scale environment and says, okay, what's in there now? And what's in there now shows up down here in the resources section. Each of these pages is essentially a laundry list of what you're managing inside your LeoStream environment. So in the desktop section, I see all of my virtual machines and I currently have this filtered, so you're only seeing two. But you'll notice here, I see 
a lot of information. It's kind of a snapshot of a different information, and you can customize this. Anytime you see a table in LeoStream, I can customize the columns so that you see the information that's most important for you. So the virtual machines show up on the desktops page and anything tagged appropriately with template or whatever you've defined shows up here as an, as an image. This is what, these are the images that are available for you to do provisioning with. The last piece in setup that I'll point on is the gateways. If you do want to use a gateway, you install it. And again, pretty much you don't have to touch that Linux system after that. You come in here and you simply say, I want to add a gateway to my broker. I've already added it. I want to add a gateway to my broker. And that's all. Now they're hooked up and ready to use. That's all you have to do. Very simple. So in the setup section, now I've hooked up to all my other pieces. Now I come, come into configuration and start defining the different VDI workflows that I want to satisfy. The first part in there is creating pools. Now, pools in LeoStream have a few different functions. One is organizational. So if you see here, I've created a pool here, which is all of the virtual machines in my scale cluster. And then I've kind of created sub pools. And some of this is just for me as organization. For example, here's one that's all of my demo VMs. And then some are based on how I want to offer these desk sets out to users. So in my particular example, I'm saying, here I have some staff VMs. These are going to be persistent VMs, belong to the staff member when they log in. But then I have some classroom VMs. These I want to refresh so the student uses it. And when they're done with the class, it goes away and a new one starts up. So what I actually did was for my staff VMs here, I, I used LeoStream provisioning tools to pre-populate the pool. I had a master image for those. And then I came in and said, you know what? I want, I want two, but I don't want any more than two. And then I came in and set the parameters that define how I'm going to create those machines. So I set a naming convention. I said which template it was going to be created out of. And then I indicated if the machine should be deletable or not. Well, in my case, these are persistent, so I don't want to delete them. So I left that blank. As soon as I saved that pool, it spun up the two staff machines that you see here. So now these are waiting and ready for users. But now let's look at the classroom. So here I haven't actually started the provisioning on this yet. I'm going to have a class, but it hasn't started yet. So there's a couple things that I could do here. I could just come in and say, well, let's provision off five machines right now. But you can also do this based on time of day. Here's where I mentioned if you are using this pool for a class that runs Monday through Friday, always at 1 PM or whatever, you can actually use these start times in here to schedule provisioning at a certain amount, at a certain time. Now, I know if I try to do that on the fly, I'll get the time wrong, so I'm just going to use this method. So here, look what's going to happen. Right now, I'm asking for five desktops, and this pool size information here tells me I have none. So five machines, I'm going to provision into my scale cluster. There's my name, there's my template, and these are going to be deletable. So now I'm going to save that pool. And as soon as I save that, I can come over here to the system log page and see that the, the connection broker is starting to trigger the provisioning. It's going to start creating those machines. And I'll see that happening over here in scale. It's basically taking a snapshot, cloning the master, and then starting up these new machines. So there's one. It'll start another one. And now scale in the background is handling placing those machines on the appropriate node in my cluster. So all we're doing is we're telling Scale, hey, here's what we need, and here's how you create it. And then it's actually using all of the logic it has built in to place it in the best location. And I'll continue seeing all of that going on while it's, while it's here. So while that job's running, let's just look at a few more LeoStream aspects, and then I'll show you the end user view. Um, the last point I want to point out here in pools is Notice I am using this pool to join the machines to the domain as well. So once the machine is created, the broker will tell the agent on the machine, OK, join the domain, and then the agent will do its thing on the machine. So that's pools. Now the next thing to think about are these plans. And a plan is essentially a set of rules that's going to be applied to the desktop that's offered to the user based on the pool that we pull it out of. The protocol plan tells us how do we want to connect the user to that machine? 
So here you see I have an example that's saying if the user uses LeoStream Connect, then I'm going to use RDP and pass it through the gateway. This is for remote users using our software client. Now, if that same user comes in from a web browser, I'm going to actually use the HTML5 viewer. It's going to pass it through the gateway and do an in-browser connection. So the protocol plan essentially tells us how. How do we connect the user? These next two plans, power control and release, here's where you start to see more of where the LeoStream agent comes in. So as an example, here's a power control plan that automatically shuts down the machine when it's released from the user. Now, now what does that mean to release a desktop from a user? Essentially, when a user logs into LeoStream, we'll offer them the desktops that you've told us to offer them from, from the pools. And then as soon as the user requests a connection to the machine, they're assigned to that machine. And it's theirs as long as that assignment sticks. To refresh a non-persistent machine or to make a shared desktop available for another user, you need to release the assignment. That release is scheduled by you in these things we call release plans. So let's look at a release plan. Here you see I have a few examples. So I mentioned that our staff are going to have persistent machines. They're going to log in and they're going to be offered a machine from a pool. And then once they get that machine, it's theirs. That means we're never going to release that machine back to the pool. So see this form? It's broken into these events. There's the disconnect. There's the logout. There's the idle. That, those are the events that are coming from the LeoStream agent. So here I'm saying whether they disconnect, log out, I don't care what the user does. I'm never releasing the machine to the pool. Now, a little more interesting plan is a non-persistent plan. So now look at the type of flexibility you have here. Here I'm saying if the user disconnects from their machine, you know, maybe they went to lunch, they're going to come back. I'm going to give them a 30-minute lunch. If they don't come back in 30 minutes, I'm going to release their machine to the pool. If they do, they can continue using it. But now that, after 30 minutes, this little event here, this releasing to the pool, that triggers this section of the plan down here. And that saying when the desktop is released, go ahead and delete it from the pool. And that delete event will end up triggering provisioning for a new machine. So that's your non-persistent. It got the old one away and the new one's coming in. So the point I want to make there is that these, these sections nest. So an event that happens based on a different event triggers the next section of the plan. And so you have a lot of flexibility in indicating you know, when does that machine get released? When should it be shut down by, by nesting these events? So we've created pools and we've created all our plans. They come together in what LeoStream calls policies. So here, for example, in my classroom policy, I'm saying I want to offer this student one machine from my classroom VMs. And then down here are the plans that are associated with it. So I'm going to connect them using the HTML5 RDP client and it's going to be a non-persistent machine. But before I show you what that looks like to an end user, you need to see how does that get applied to the end user. And that's done in these assignment tables here. Now, if you remember in the setup stage, I created authentication servers, and I had two rows there. Let me show you. We have a LeoStream domain and a sub dev domain here. If I look here in the assignments page, it's the same two rows. The broker automatically creates these role, ro rows when you create an authentication server. And inside of there are the rules that you create that indicate how we assign policies and essentially pools and desktops to users. So by default, it says based on the group the user belongs in, their AD a member of attribute, and where they come in from. If you remember, I said in, in LeoStream, different things are based on locations. A location is LeoStream is essentially a group of clients, and you have the ability to, to define what those locations are. But here I've essentially said when users come in from a LeoStream client, that's LeoStream Connect, they're going to get a staff VM, and users coming in from a web browser, they get a classroom VM. Now, you go through all those configuration steps before you have users log in, and you want to try it out and make sure you got it all right. Well, we have this handy little test login feature, so you can do that. So let's simulate just my login as an end user, and let's say I'm coming in from a web browser. I run the test, and I see the logic that LeoStream is going to step through 
once that user really does log in. So here it finds me in my authentication server, looks up my member of attributes, and then it starts stepping through the assignment table for that authentication server. And what LeoStream does is it steps through the rules and still it, until it finds the first rule that the user matches. And then that defines the role and the policy that that user is going to have. And now here I ultimately see the VM that I'm going to be connected to. And here you should see now there's the five VMs. They're all there. They've been joined to the domain. I can come over here and click status to make sure the LeoStream agent is communicating properly. And so I should be ready to rock. So here, same web interface, same IP address, but I'm going to log in as an end user. Again, you have control over what you want this to look like, so you can customize it for your brand. And then I'm going to go ahead and connect to that machine. Now, these are new machines, right? So in the background, what's happening is the LeoStream agent is adding my user to the RDP group, so I have permission to RDP to the machine. And then the gateway is taking over the connection and launching the HTML5 connection here in the browser. What you see here on the system log page in the broker is you see all of that going on. So I can see when I logged in. I can see what machine the user was offered. Once the login finishes, it's doing my roaming profile because I don't have FS logic. But once the user logs in, finish the login finishes processing, you'll see the LeoStream agent notification come in. And then everything is off and running. So there's my LeoStream agent notice. There's my section being logged in. And now we're good to go. And then for this particular machine, I'll wait until the login finishes. And then when the user logs out, you'll see that the machine will get deleted. This is a login's taking a little longer than it did last time I did this. <laughs> but I have no control over that from LeoStream's perspective. Mm -hmm. log in. Well, while that's going, I'll show you here. So now here on the desktops page, you saw this assigned user column. Before it was empty, now you see that machine is assigned to me. And that's another handy part of this page once you're kind of up and running and going. You can always come to this page and see who's using what. I can click the status link to see that the LeoStream agent notifies me that, yep, that user is logged in. And you, as the admin, can even come in here and forcefully log the user out. So now if somebody leaves for the week and, you, and they forgot to log out of the system, you can force it out that way. And that is essentially the demo. I will try and figure out how to hand it back to Scott. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. All right. I'm just going to show the last screen here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to type it into the questions chat in the bottom. Uh, if not, uh, I put everybody's contact information on here. Uh, so if you have any questions that are scale related, feel free to reach out to scale at, uh, channel at scalecomputing.com. Uh, the LeoStream folks, if you have any opportunities, maybe if they're not tied to scale, uh, feel, free to feel free to reach out to them, sales at leostream.com. And at the end of the day, you can always contact your Promark team, um, your, your local rep, anybody on the team, and they can direct you to the appropriate individuals within our teams as well so that you don't have to go to, uh, you don't have to remember all these different reps to deal with. Um, and in, in regards, if there's any questions to um, specific partnership inquiries or anything like that, feel free to reach out to either of us. This is a very close relationship that we have with them.